this is twelve bits further. I should be here at six. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Alright, thanks. I just want to make sure I'm pretty sure. Tell me your name again. Ayan. Ayan. Assalamualaikum. Oh, yeah. How are you? How's your week? 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 What our individual people are giving there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alameen. Tonight we're covering a very important hadith. And uh, from a very important book. Shall I make yourself comfortable? Allahumma salli wa I'm going to record the audio, shall we? Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin, wa alihi wa sallam, wa sallam, taslima kathira ila yawm al-deen. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Inshallah. Khair. So tonight we're going to cover a very important hadith. It's from a very blessed book, very blessed collection. I'm sure many of you have heard of before. Many of you have read. It's called The Shema'il of Imam At-Tirmidhi. Anyone heard of this book before? Shema'il of Imam At-Tirmidhi. Raise your hand if you heard of it. Very famous book uh, studied all throughout the Muslim world. And uh, it is a, a book that was composed by uh, Sheikh Abu Isa, uh, Muhammad bin Isa Tirmidhi. Uh, he passed away in um, 279 after the Hijrah of the Prophet So he's from the Salaf. He, and he was from Uzbekistan. He's from Uzbekistan, from the city of Tirmidhi actually from a place called Bukh, and he was from the same area that Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim were from. In fact, he's a student. He was a student of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. Uh, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with all of them. Uh, he is most famous for his great work, uh, the Jami of Imam At-Tirmidhi, the compilation of Imam At-Tirmidhi, which is a collection of different ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, and it is so uh, valuable that it is included accord, uh, in what is called Al Kutub As Sitta. In what is called what? Al Kutub As Sitta, the six books. Some people mistakenly say Sahih Sitta. They're not all Sahih. Okay. They're not all Sahih. But they're called Al Kutub As Sitta, the six books. And these are really the books after the book of Allah Ta'ala that uh, the uh, Ahlul Sunnah, the majority mainstream Muslims around the world follow. Okay? The Ithna Ashari, Ja'fari Muslims, uh, they have other books of Hadith and books of the uh, Manaqib of Ahlul Bayt, uh, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt that they follow, but really the Sunnis, the Ahlul Sunnah, they, they follow the Quran and then they follow these six books. Really, this is what makes someone a quote-unquote Sunni, so to speak. It was said about his jami' that it is the most beneficial book of hadith for the one who is not a scholar. 
the most beneficial book of hadith for the one who is not a scholar. His jami is ranked usually fourth uh, in the hierarchy of books that are authentic. Of course, Imam al-Bukhari is sahih. The majority of scholars say is the most authentic that goes at the top, followed by the sahih of Imam Muslim, followed by the sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, followed by the jami of Imam Tirmidhi, and then the uh, sunan of Imam al-Nasai, and then the sunan of Imam Ibn Majah. And these are the six. Okay. Now this book, uh, Ash-Shama'il al muhammadiyah it is called. Ash-Shama'il means character traits, personality traits. Your Shama'il are your qualities, your characteristics. And in this book, the Imam has collected, the Imam has collected over 400 ahadith, over 400 ahadith that describe what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu looked like. In fact, his description, and these are the descriptions that are eyewitness accounts. These are the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa describing his blessed face, his blessed form for us. And it has been recorded. In fact, the descriptions are so precise, if a forensic artist, you know the forensic artists, right, that construct these likenesses based on descriptions, they can actually give you a portrait of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa almost exactly how he looked sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But as Muslims, we don't make images of the prophets and messengers alayhi wa sallam, right? with drawings and with paintings. This is not uh, permissible according to the majority of our scholars. And so what did we do? We painted portraits with words. We painted pictures with words. And these words have been enough for us for over 1400 years. <clears throat> this book, as Shemal al-Muhammadiyah, is a book that every Muslim should have in their home. Imam Tirmidhi did us a great, great, great uh, service by compiling these 400 plus ahadith. He begins by describing the khalq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was the form? What did his body look like? It describes how tall he was, how short, uh, I'm sorry, how tall he was, the complexion of his skin, the shape of his face, how many gray hairs he had in his beard, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and all these things. And then he goes into what he used to wear, how he dressed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he would treat people, his smile, his laugh, his armor, his pets, the domesticated animals, that were around him, how he interacted with his servants, how he interacted with his wives, how he treated children, and so on and so on and so forth, how he would offer his prayer. This book is so deep and it's so touching, it will bring tears to your eyes. And he ends this book, he ends this book with three sections, three chapters. The second to the last is the chapter on his last days, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next chapter is, and when I, subhanallah, when I just said that, I remember when I was studying this book uh, in Mauritania, in the desert of Mauritania, with uh, Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj, may Allah preserve him and benefit us through him. I remember when we reached that section of the death of Rasulullah, wafat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I remember Murabt al-Hajj. You know, the Mauritanians are very laid back people. All right? in the, especially in the deserts. They're yeah, Bedou, eh, Ahlu Bedou. They're Bedouins. And so when they teach, even when they study, they lie down, you know. They sit back. I'm not telling you to do that. <laughs> but even the ulama, even the scholars and the students, they take it, they're very relaxed. Very relaxed. They lie down on the floor. And I'll tell you more stories another time. 
But when I got to this section on the passing of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Murad Abdul Hajj got up and he stood up straight and he closed his eyes and he started saying La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. And the whole time I was reading that section, me and my, my, my dear friend, who's Sheikh um, Najm uh, al-Thaqib, uh, we, you know, he was in a state, he was in a very, very, very heavy state until the end of the book. So you could see that it affected him. And now Murabat al-Hajj is over, well over 100 years old. When I studied with him, he was probably in his 90s, you know, probably in his 90s. May Allah preserve him. So the, net, the, the first to the last section deals with the legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he left, his heirs, right, his uh, miraf. And then the last chapter deals with the ru'ya of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seeing him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seeing him in your dreams and seeing him awake. And one of my teachers who I studied this book with, Sheikh Muhammad Al-Yaqubi, may Allah preserve him, he said that all the times he's been teaching the Shimal of Muhammadiyah, since the time he was a young man, he was, he was given khutbah at the Masjid of Banu Umayyah when he was 14 years old. Right? Great scholar. He studied 500 books, he said, with his father. 500 with his father. He said, there is almost no time that he teaches this book that when he finishes it, people do not see Rasulullah Sallallahu There's at least a few people in the, in the gathering that see Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Yeah. And this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us good tidings of, in authentic hadith, in authentic ahadith, in sahih ahadith. And this, as I was saying earlier today in the khutbah, is a part of our building a spiritual connection with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, we have uh, plans to cover the whole book. It's 400 plus hadith. If you're going quickly and sitting like this, sitting like this, just the way we're sitting, for eight hours a day, you can finish it in usually three to four days. Right, three to four days. Uh, the other way to do it is just to go through it bit by bit, you know. But um, a lot of times people don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the stamina to wait a whole year to finish the book. Yeah, so inshallah, our plan is to complete the entire text. And alhamdulillah, I was blessed to, to read this book uh, with three different scholars, uh, with their chains back to the Prophet Sallallahu and back to Imam at uh, The first of them, of course, was uh, Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj. Uh, the second was Sheikh Muhammad al-Yaqubi who uh, my, I read this book on him and if you want maybe later on uh, some of you you can see how he signed the end of the book so when you study hadith when you finish the hadith it's good to register and to do what's called tedween you register your presence even if you're not there for the whole book when the sheikh finishes or the sheikh finishes whatever you heard directly from the sheikh you should register that and actually back in our history these were very important they would keep city records of who would be present at the recitation of the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the muslims were very very meticulous about this and you can still go to libraries and you can find uh, these uh, so alhamdulillah so this is you know this is imam this is his writing alhamdulillah and uh, then i had the blessing of studying it uh, again with and from beginning to end with sheikh muhammad and Ninawi, uh, may Allah preserve him as well, with their continuous unbroken chains uh, back to the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this particular book. We're not going to go through the whole book uh, today, okay. inshallah ta'ala, unless you're ready for eight hours. Huh? Huh? Ustaz Muhammad. No. <laughs> We're going to look at a particular hadith uh, that is really one of my most beloved hadith uh, in this text, and uh, it is known as Hadithu Um Zara. Hadithu what? 
Um Zara. Right? Um, of course, means mother. Zara is a name. Right? Zara means vegetation, farming, right? cultivation. Zara, Um Zara was a woman. And this hadith is about her. And this hadith gives you all the keys, all the mafatih, all the secrets, all the asrar for having a healthy, a happy, and a holy marriage. A marriage that is holy and happy and healthy, uh, as I mentioned earlier d- during the khutbah. It is under the section, Babu ma jaa fi kalami Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi summer. The, what has come regarding the, the uh, speech, the conversation of the Messenger of God, Allah bless him and grant him peace, to Samar. Well, you know anyone named Samar or Samra? Right, it means dark, right? Right, someone who's brown skinned like me, this is called Asmar, right, in Arabic, Asmar. So Samar means at nighttime, Filayl. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talk about at nighttime? Right. And this gives us an idea of how we should spend our nights. How we should spend our nights. Alhamdulillah. So the first hadith we're not going to read. It's a very interesting hadith uh, that uh, will come to another time. But uh, it's about these uh, strange stories that they used to tell about jinn, people being abducted by jinn, and then going and being taken to fantastic places where amazing things and strange things gharaib wal ajaib would happen and then they would come back to their tribes and they would share what happened it's similar to our UFO abductees in our day and age <laughs> so there's a whole hadith about this by the way but we're going to skip that hadith and go to straight to the hadith um zara of course as always uh, in our sessions of hadith we'll start with the hadith of Abdullah bin Amr uh, on the authority of Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, and we narrate it with our uh, continuous chain back to him through our shuyukh, may Allah ta'ala be pleased with, with all of them, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ar-Rahimun yarhamuhum ar-Rahman irhamu man fil ard yarhamukum man fi sama aw irhamu man fil ard yarhamukum man fi sama that the Messenger of God, Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, be compassionate, be loving, and the ultimate, the one who is the most compassionate, the most loving, the most merciful, will show you compassion. Show compassion to those who are upon the earth, and those who are in the heavens will show compassion to you. This is called Hadith al awwaliya Hadith al-Rahmah bin awwaliya the hadith of compassion through uh, being the first hadith that is usually narrated by a, a scholar of hadith to their students and you all have license to transmit that to your children inshallah ta'ala and your friends and your family so let's go into this hadith of umzara bismillah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Hadith al-Umzara. It's uh, the 38th chapter. The section on what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa discussed at night time. Ah, oh, I see. The speech during the night. Yeah. It has been translated. There's maybe one or two translations that are out there. And there's even a khulasa that uh, Shaykh al-Kittani from Morocco, radiallahu anhu, uh, did. Uh, that's about 200 ahadith, alhamdulillah. Tayyip. Of course. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Alhamdulillah. That's it. We're not going to go through the whole hadith. It's a long hadith. As I said earlier, we'll break this up into three parts, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, we will just start today. We'll just, you know, make some headway today. Hadith um zara. حدثنا علي بن حجر أخبرنا عيسى بن يونس عن هشام بن عروة أن أخيه عبد الله عبد الله بن عروة عن عروة عن عائشة رضي الله عنها 
Habibat Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi qalat. So we'll stop here. So tayyib for the the sanad. From Isa ibn from Isa ibn Yunus from Hisham ibn Urwa from his brother Abdullah ibn Urwa from Urwa from Aisha radiyallahu anha. No, we'll stop there. Okay. Stop. So they don't mention in the translation Ali bin Hajar, but he's also part of the chain of transmitters. Ali bin Hajar. All right, those of you who are writing this down. In the past, you know, things were different. The scholar of Hadith would, in the, wouldn't be reading like me from the book. He would have it memorized. He would be narrating it, and then the students would be writing the Hadith. That's how it used to be. Right. That's how he's before the printing press, right, before books were printed. May Allah reward our ancestors. So this is a hadith that's narrated on the authority of uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, and it is an authentic hadith. It is sahih. Imam Muslim records it in his sahih, alhamdulillah. And uh, this is a conversation that she herself is relating to the Prophet sallallahu You know, women like to tell stories, right? Right? The brothers don't want to say anything. <laughs> She's telling a story to the Prophet sallallahu A story. And it's not about anything necessarily religious, as you'll see. She's spending time with her husband during the evening. They're not watching. And I'm, just want, I'm just contextualizing here. I don't mean literally. They're not watching uh, movies. They're not watching uh, Netflix, right? They're not uh, out, you know, spending money at a restaurant, an expensive restaurant. They're spending time together. And Aisha, our mother, Lady Aisha radiallahu anha, she relates this long story. And the Prophet sallallahu does not interrupt her one time. There's a lesson here for us, not just for husbands, but for wives even. When your spouse wants to share something with you, even if you may not think it is very important, listen. Listen. And don't interrupt them. There are many lessons here for us in our marriages, but learn to listen. In fact, there's a, there's a marriage course I do, inshallah. We'll do it here, inshallah, uh, soon, once the dust settles. Right? But one of the things we go over is the, the art of listening. How to be an engaged and compassionate listener. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the best of listeners. He didn't speak a lot. The companions actually said he was the most silent of people. Askatun nas. The most silent of people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, he, he was known for his silence. But when he spoke, uh, no one wanted him to stop talking. Few words. He was a person of very few words, but his words were always very deep and very meaningful. But at the same time, they were, give, they were articulated in such a way that everyone could understand at their level. Everyone could understand at their level, right? The great, great scholars like Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib could understand. And people like Sayyidina Nu'iman, Nu'iman, everyone knows about Nu'iman. Al Himar, they used to call him the donkey. One of the Sahaba, he used to make practical jokes all the time. Right? We'll talk about him another time. I don't want to digress. But Nu'iman, all of them could understand the Prophet. So he used to have an alcohol problem. He used to drink Nu'iman, radiallahu anhu. He's the one the Sahaba talked about him when they were uh, flogging him for drinking in public, right? And being drunk in public. The, some of the Sahaba were cursing him. And what did Rasulullah say? Don't help shaitan against your brother. Indeed. He loves Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look, Sahabi in Medina who drinks alcohol, being beaten, right? 
Because that's the had. If you drink in public, then you have to. Al Asa Liman Asa, right? They say. The stick is for the one who breaks the rules. And one of the Sahaba is saying some you know, harsh things about him. But does the Prophet وسلم, join them? No. He says, don't help shaitan against your brother. Because indeed, Allah subhanahu he loves Allah and his messenger. Yes, he has a problem with his addiction, with the alcohol. But he still has mahabba of Allah and his messenger It's a so big lesson for us. Just because someone is disobeying Allah, even something like drinking alcohol, which is fisk, or that's a big sin. That's a kabira, major sin. The Prophet Muhammad is still making shahada, bearing witness that he has love for Allah and His Messenger. Well, maru ma'aman ahab. The person will be with the one they love. So our mother Aisha radiallahu says, Jalasat, Jalasat ihda ashrata imra'atan fata'ahadna wa ta'aqadna an la yaktumna min akhbari azwajihinna shay'a. Aisha radiallahu anha reported one day there sat together 11 women making an explicit promise amongst themselves that they would not conceal anything about their spouses. Oh, wow. So they, these 11 women were sitting down together. Umzara is among the 11 women. So it's Umzara and 10 other women and they make a pact, they make an oath that they're going to share everything about their husbands, everything, good, bad and ugly. <clears throat> this is how Aisha begins. And again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say, uh, uh, stop, stop. She's telling the story to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is she going to say? <clears throat> what is she going to share? The ulama, there's a really good uh, authoritative commentary on Imam Al-Tirmidhi's Shama'il called uh, by Imam Al-Jasus. Imam Al-Jasus. He says, the ulama disagree about whether these 11 women really existed. They believe, it's believed that they are from Yemen. Allah knows best if they really were alive and they really had these husbands, or whether it's just a legend that's been passed on. They, the scholars also say that these women are not making ghiba because Either they came before the time of Islam and they had not received guidance, or they don't know each other's husbands. The identities of, the, of their husbands are concealed. They know each other, but they don't know the men that they're talking about. Okay. And <clears throat> the last thing uh, I want to point out before we begin the hadith is that Qadi uh, Ayyad al uh, who was a great Andalusian scholar, Qadi Ayyad al Yahsubi, he has a commentary, a whole book, just on this hadith. <laughs> just on this one hadith of Umzara, which is, is very deep and very beneficial. Many ulama have written about this hadith, it's so important. And really, anyone who's married or anyone who's planning to get married, you owe it to yourself and you owe it to your spouse to study this hadith many times. Many times. Bismillah. فَقَالَتِ الْأُولَى زَوْجِي لَحْمُ جَمَلٍ غَثْ عَلَى رَأْسِ جَبَلٍ The first one said وَعْرٍ لَا سَهْلُ فَيُرْتَقَى لَا سَهْلُ فَيُرْتَقَى وَلَا سَمِينُ فَيُنْتَقَى the first one said, My husband is like the meat of a lean, weak camel, which is kept on the top of a mountain, which is neither easy to climb, nor is the meat fat, so that, might, so that one might put up with the trouble of fetching it. Tayyip. So it starts off a little rough, okay? <laughs> the first sister has nothing good to say about her husband. Nothing. Now there's a mixture. I've told you this already. Some of the women, they... They, all they do is praise their husbands. Some of the women, all they do is complain. Some, it's hard to tell. It's a mixture. But the first woman, she doesn't have anything good to say. And 
this uh, this this hadith also is it is admired for its eloquence. These women are very eloquent. It is a testament to the eloquence and the beauty of al lughat al arabiyya al fusha of classical Arabic. So this hadith is also used uh, to teach language. So what does she say? Zawji, my husband. Now in the Quran, Zawj is used for husband and wife. There's, you won't find, and if anyone knows otherwise, correct me, but you won't find Zawja in the Quran. Modern standard Arabic, there's Zawj for husband and Zawja for wife. But in the Quran, it's the same, Zawj. Husband and wife, Zawj. There's no time Mabuta added. And I'm saying that because these qualities are not just for men, right? Some of the sisters were laughing, right? But this can easily apply to women, just as men. I noticed none of the brothers were laughing, <laughs> right? This, is, this class is, and this uh, daughter is not meant to beat up men, no. It's for us to look at ourselves. And each husband, even if you're a woman, and each husband, ask yourself, is this describing me? Even if you're a woman, is this describing me? What improvements can I make? Don't ask, is this describing my, my spouse? Okay, <laughs> unless it's good. Look at yourself. Zawji, my spouse, my husband, lahmu jammal, is like the meat of a camel, ghath. So ghath, the, the meaning that my shuyukh taught me, and I, with all due respect to the translation, Ghath, and you can look at look the word up. Ghath means rotten, right? It's not just lean. Yani it's meat <laughs> that is lean and meat that is rotten. Okay. So she's saying, my my spouse, my partner, is like rotten camel's meat. It's like the the, the rotten meat of a camel that's lean. So the cow, camel is lean. But then the, re the meat has spoiled. But not only that, Jabal, it's on top of a mountain. You can't you can hardly see it. It's far away, it's distant. Ba'id, ba'id, ba'id. Wa'arin la sahlun fa yurtaqa. It's difficult to get to. It's not easy to climb, right? For yurtaqa means to climb, right? To go up. It's difficult. It's not easy to go to 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 go up the mountain to get to the meat. Well, for yurtaqal, and it, there's no fat left on it that you would even once you got there that you want to sh you can share it with others. <laughs> there's nothing on the there's nothing on the meat. For you to share, there's nothing. For, for, uh, yeah, there's nothing there for you to nourish yourself. Even what is she saying about her husband? She has no communication. No communication. Difficult to reach. Difficult to reach. Very stubborn. Very stubborn, hard. No good qualities. Right? Rotten, lean. Now he doesn't nourish me. Doesn't sustain me. So the, the Muslim is looking to be the opposite of this. You want to be accessible to your spouse. You want to be reachable. And not only that, you want your interaction with, that, with your wife or with your husband to be something that gives value to the other person. Not just financial value, but spiritual value moral, social, communal value to your spouse. There's, there's some that you are an asset to their life, not a liability. Are we on the same page? We're on the same page. Okay. Brothers, are we okay? Yeah. The brothers are, are very quiet. <laughs> this is the most quiet I've seen the brothers in the Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah for the hadith of the Prophet 
قالت الثانية زوجي لا أبث خبره إني أخاف أن لا أذره إني أخاف أن لا أذره إن أذكره أذكر عجره وبجره The second one said I shall not relate my husband's news for I fear that I may not be able to finish his story for if I describe him I will mention all of his defects and bad traits Ya Allah So the second woman is like the first nothing good to say All right, nothing good to say. And she kind of breaks the deal. All right? They made a deal to share, Ya Allah. She, they made a deal to share everything, but she kind of, she breaks the deal, doesn't she? Yes and no. She says, Zawji, my husband, la abathu khabara. I'm not going to share his information with you, his news. I won't, I'm not going to share it with you. Inni akhafu and la abara. I fear that if I start telling you about my husband, we're going to be here all night. <laughs> I won't stop. Right. In adhkurhu adhkur ujara. If I mention him to you, if I mention his qualities, I have only udara. I have only bad things to say, defects, deficiencies, faults to say. وَبُجَرَةٌ And his inward and outward deficiencies. طيب. <laughs> third, third wife. So again, she doesn't say anything specific, but she's saying that, you know, my, my marriage, my husband, uh, she, they, this woman, these two women are, are in marriages that are bad. Bad marriages, not fulfilling. Now there's a whole nother, one of my dear friends, uh, Ustad Luqman Williams, radiyallahu anhu wa rahmatullahi He also, uh, in his commentary on this hadith, he said that there's also something here going on with the women. Like, why would you stay with these men? That's a whole other issue. Why would you stay with these men in these situations? And that's a whole other class. Right? Why women or why men Hus stay with spouses that... Uh, are not bringing them closer to Allah Ta'ala and actually are holding them back. You know, we tell people to have sabr all the time, right? The sabr, you should have sabr, but there's a point where the sabr is actually keeping you from getting close to Allah Ta'ala, right? And that's where you have to look at your options. Anyway, Qalat Al-Thalitha, the third woman said, Zawjil Ashanaq in Antik Utalaq. وَإِنْ أَسْكُتْسْ They all rhyme. It's shaja. This is called shaja. Rhyme prose. So it's very eloquent. It rhymes. Af what? It's hard. It's, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. I try to understand those words. I will. I will. Zawji, Zawji al Right. Go ahead. The third one said, My husband is a tall man. If I describe him, he will divorce me. And if I keep quiet, he will neither divorce me nor treat me as a wife. They have a, something in parentheses, okay. which I don't know who. Yeah, don't. How that got in yeah, don't, don't, just leave it. Yeah. So let me give you a better, it, it needs to be retranslated. Uh, let me give you, inshallah, a better translation. Zawji al ashanak Al ashanak is someone who is tall. But that's all. They're just tall. They're not tall and handsome. They're not tall and smart. They're not tall and wealthy. They're not tall and righteous. They're just tall. They're not tall and brave. They're just tall. This is Al-Ashannaq. <laughs> so she says, my husband is tall, but his height doesn't have any virtue. Just tall. Well, in Antik, if I speak, utallaq. So this is not referring to the, the, her actual speaking to the women as the translator, may Allah you know, reward them for their effort with good in this life and hereafter. I mean, what she's saying is, if I speak in the house, he would divorce me. Oh, if you open her mouth. Oh my God. If I speak in the house, I'm divorced. 
in antik utallaq. If I speak, so this is a woman who is being terrorized by her partner, right? She has to walk on eggshells. If she says the wrong thing, I divorce you. If I, she says the wrong, does the wrong thing, go back to your mother, go back to the... Right? There are some marriages that are like this. And this is haram. It is haram to do this to a woman. It is haram to do this to a man, right? to do this to your spouse. This is dhulm. It is oppression, right? And no person should have to have sabr, have patience with this kind of situation. Please, and especially our older sisters, don't, don't tell our younger sisters to have sabr with this, right? A woman should not have to spend 50 years under this. 60 years under this. Nor, my dear elders, don't encourage our young brothers to be... Uh, some sisters are very smart, right? And I encourage all sisters, study fiqh. Study Islamic jurisprudence, especially the fiqh of nikah and talaq. Especially the fiqh of marriage and divorce. Some sisters are very smart. They study the fiqh of marriage and divorce before they get married. And so they make sure that the, the aqad, the contract, is very detailed. They even give themselves the right to divorce. Because right? Right. they know the sharia very well. And so some of these sisters, and I've, even a case came to me one time, the sister is holding divorce over the brother's head. Right. Why? Because she, she's faqiha. She knows her fiqh. It's in the contract. right? And now the brother is walking on eggshells. So no fiqh, my sisters. You will protect your rights, but don't use it to take advantage of your spouse. Fiqh is not used for this. And then she says, so if I speak, I will be divorced. When askut, but if I'm silent, or unlock, I'm left hanging. You know what that is, to be left hanging? You don't know if, I don't know if he loves me, I don't know if he hates me. I don't know if we're going to be married tomorrow. I don't know if we're going to be divorced tomorrow. She's in this emotional limbo. Emotional limbo. Again, haram. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, and really, really, my beloved brothers and sisters, this hadith is all about the Prophet ﷺ and his relationship with Aisha. When you get to the end, you'll see this. And I hope some of you read ahead. You know, it's very easy to search for this hadith. Don't leave your spouse hanging. If you love them, tell them. If you love them, show it in your actions. People have different love languages. Who knows about the love languages? Anyone? Raise your hand. Five, five. Anyone? Just two, three? Or only sisters? Ya Allah. Right. Okay. Men knew that before marriage. Allahu Akbar. That's why nobody knows. <laughs> so there are five love languages. Five, they call them love languages. It's a really good book called The Five, the, the five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And uh, there's the language of giving gifts, the language of affection, right? Showing physical affection. There's the language of spending quality time. The language of positive words and appreciation. And then there's the, the last one, uh, is the language of service. And if you study the life of the Prophet Wasallam, he used all of them. He used all of them. Giving gifts, did he give gifts? Yes. Did he say positive words? فَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَيُوْكُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah in the final, in the last day, let him say good or what? Be quiet. Be quiet. Like our grandmothers used to say here in America, and I'm sure yours as well, if you don't, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything. It's prophetic character. He used to say good words, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did he spend quality time with people? Absolutely. Especially with his family. Like this hadith is about that, right? Spending quality time with Lady Aisha. Did he serve his family? Yes. Lady Aisha radiallahu anha said, Kana Rasulullah fi mihnati alihi. 
he was always in the service of his family, always doing chores around the house, وسلم, always helping his wife, his wives, helping his children in the house and outside the house. Right. And uh, did he, um, well, what's the last one? Uh, did, did he show affection? Absolutely. He would kiss his wives, he would kiss his children, he would hug them, right? And not only that, with the Sahaba as well, you know, so. So he, he practiced all, and then more. You know, with, if you study the Rasulullah I guarantee you'll find more than five ways of showing love. So we should be approachable, uh, which is the first hadith. The second, we, um, she doesn't go into detail. But we should be aware of our inward and outward defect, defects and qualities and strive to develop ourselves. Don't just be the same way for 50 years, 60 years. Improve, right? Get, become better. It's the, you, are, you are never finished with the business of self-improvement. And then the third woman, yeah, we should not use divorce, misuse divorce. And I, you know, there's all these stories people come to, I won't mention the, the, the countries or the people. People come to the brother's house and they're full because they've been, you know, maybe it's Eid, they've been going to other houses, they, they're, too, they're too full to eat. Shab'an, right? The brother says, if you don't eat, my wife is divorced. <laughs> Poor woman, right? These things happen, <laughs> right? No, we should not misuse divorce. It, it, it is a very serious thing, and sometimes it is necessary. But if you do your due diligence, inshallah ta'ala, by, uh, by doing the proper research and making shura with your family and your elders and your friends before you marry a person, uh, and you have consultation with them during the marriage, and don't wait till things blow up, right? Inshallah, we can avoid divorce in our community. Alhamdulillah. The, so we'll talk about one more woman, okay? And it's a positive, it's positive. So we'll end on a positive note, inshallah ta'ala. Qalat al rabia zawji kalayli tihama la har wa la qar wa la makhafata wa la sama. The fourth one said, My husband is a moderate person like the night of Tehama, which is neither hot nor cold. I am neither afraid of him nor am I discontented with him. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. So the fourth woman, she says, My husband is like the night of Tehama. Tehama is an area that's right on the outskirts of Mecca. Right? And at night, there would they'd be this breeze. You know, the Arabs... They would, they would, you know, welcome and, and, and seek out the nights when this breeze would come from the direction of Tihama. Right? So it's a place, you can go there today, Tihama. When you make Hajj or Umrah, inshallah, you can ask the taxi drivers, your, your guide, to take you there. When the breeze comes from the, the direction of Tihama, it's mu'tadil, it's moderate. La har wa la qar. It's not hot. Right? No one likes a hot breeze, especially when you're in Mecca, right? And at nighttime, you don't want a freezing breeze that goes to your bones, right? It's neither that, it's neither one of the two extremes. It is balanced, it is moderate. So this is how her husband is. And she loves this. And she loves him. Zawji kalayla, laylati, kalayli tihama. And she does not fear him. She does not fear her husband. Okay. And she's not discontent with him. So your spouse, you should not try to make your spouse afraid of you. Or use fear to control your wife or to control your husband. That relationship, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, should be based on what? Mawadda and Rahma. Love, loving, respect, and kindness that is expressed. Mawadda is something you show. Wa Rahma and compassion. Yani you're there to, to protect each other, to nurture each other unconditionally. A mother who is healthy, 
in her fitrah, she loves her child. The child kicks her, right? After the first trimester, she still loves the child. The child turns around the cord, pinches her inside. She still loves the child. She might go through labor for a whole 12 hours, 24 hours, two days, three days. The baby's born, she loves the child. The child, you know, urinates on her, defecates on her, she loves the child. This is rahmah. The child spits on her. She still loves the child. And maybe the child grows up and only calls when they need money. <laughs> she still loves the child. This is rahma. That's what rahma is. It's unconditional. Unconditional love. And so this is what our relationships with our husbands should be based on, and our, and our wives should be based on. One, one more, one, just one more, because I, I really like this one. Um, and it's short. The other ones start to get long after this. Qalat al-Khamisa, the fifth woman. Zawji in dakhala fahid. When kharaja asid. Wa la yis'alu amma ahid. The fifth one said, My husband, when entering, is a leopard, and when he, when he is outside, he's a lion. He does not ask about the state of his home. And, uh, very, very short. One of the signs of eloquence is brevity. Right? Brevity is a sign of eloquence. So she's very short. She says, My husband, when he comes in the house, he's like a leopard. Okay. Now, this can be interpreted different ways. So the scholars, some scholars interpret this hadith in a negative way, that she's complaining about her husband. Others interpret it in positive. So I'll give you the, the negative first, then we, so we can end on the positive. All right. So some scholars say that the husband comes in like a leopard, which is a predatory animal. So he comes in like a leopard, predator. He's fast, you know? Leopard's fast. Right? In and out doesn't spend time with the family. Right? in kharaja, but when he goes out, asid. He's like a lion. Ah, what, is, what do lions do? They eat, 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 and then they what? Sleep. They just yeah, hang out all day, lazily. I don't contribute anything. Many times if you study lions, right, a pack of lions, a pride, they will let the women Hunt, right? The, the, the lionesses, the lionesses, they do the hunting. And when they, after they catch the gazelle or the zebra or something, where they come, what do they do? They take it for themselves. They make, they drive away the lionesses and the cubs. They eat, they eat, they eat until they're full. And then they walk away and leave the, 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 <laughs> the leftovers for the lionesses and the, and the, and the cubs. In kharaja right? asids. When he leaves, he's like a lion. Right. <coughs> and when he, he's absent, he's wala, and he doesn't ask about what he has given us as a trust, ahid, as a covenant. And he, he's forgetful. He doesn't follow up on things. Right? He's not a good manager. So this is the negative way of looking at the hadith. Now, some of the ulama, as I said, look at it in a positive light. So let's look at that. In dakhala, fahid means if he enters, he's like a leopard. The leopard is a very playful animal. So some ulama say, no, 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 this is not negative at all. She's praising her husband. That when he comes into the house, he's very playful. He jokes around. He's easygoing. Like a leopard. But in kharaja asid, and when he goes out, he's like a lion. When he goes out of his house, he's the king. Right? He has heba, he has waqar, he has dignity. He's not playing with people. No, he, people, he's, he's very serious, and people take him very serious, like a lion. This is how, very similar to how the Prophet ﷺ was in his house. He would joke with his wives, joke with his children, joke, play with the children. He would let Hassan Hussein and the children play on his back. 
he would, you know, play jokes on Aisha radiallahu anha. Like one of the narrations say that one time Lady Aisha radiallahu anha was sleeping, and the Prophet Sallallahu tied one of the locks of her hair to a bed, the bed, and he woke her up, right? And he, yeah, she like, uh, he called her Aisha, and she woke up, and her head was tied to the bed. You know, some of the times his wives would have food fights, right? You know this, right? Hafsa, Aisha, Zainab, they would put food. One would throw food on the other, and they would look at Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah. Look at what she did to me. He said, ah, go, you have a right. <laughs> okay, and they, and they would play. He would recite, they would recite poetry to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he would listen. And, um, so he was playful, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with his wives. And in a hadith, um, he actually t advised one of the young Sahaba. One of there was a young Sahabi who wanted to marry a woman who was very old. Right? And she, he said, why don't you marry a young woman who you can play with her and she can play with you? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the only things from haq, from truth, that a man should amuse himself with are his weapons, right? his horse, and his wife. And this is where our entertainment is from. Right? So this is what he advised the Sahaba. And that's a hadith, we could talk about that. Because that hadith for most men in the modern age, yeah, that we don't have a frame of reference for that. Who, do we, any of you have horses here? <laughs> and who has weapons? Are, you know, a bow and an arrow or things like this that they, we don't, we don't have a martial culture anymore. Right? And then the entertainment was not going out to spend money somewhere to entertain yourself. The entertainment was with your family. Right? This, is the, this is how the, the things were in the time of the Prophet and his family. We need to revive this. We need to revive this. And then we'll end here. He doesn't ask about the things that he entrusts. So he tells his wife, take care of this for me. When he comes home, he doesn't say, did you take care of this for me? He trusts her. Right? He trusts that she took care of it. He's not nagging her all the time. No one likes to be nagged. Husbands don't like to be nagged by wives, and wives don't like to be nagged by husbands. So this is the positive way of looking at it. We ask that Allah Ta'ala give us uh, the good virtues that we've heard, and the opposite of the negative that we've heard Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. May Allah make us spouses uh, that bring coolness to the eyes of our spouses. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina kurata ayunin waj'alna lil muttaqina imama wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam muhammadin wa alayhi wa sallam O our nurturer, our master, we ask that you make from our spouses and from our children those who bring tears of joy cool tears to our eyes and that you make us leaders for those who are reverent, those who are obedient to you, those who are conscious of you, Ya Allah. Subhana Rabbika. May Allah Ta'ala give us success to complete this hadith and to learn from this hadith. May Allah Ta'ala help us to have marriages that are beloved to Allah and that bring happiness to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala put love between our husbands and our wives, like the love between Sayyidina Rasulullah and Sayyidatuna Khadija Al-Kubra radiallahu anha. We ask that Allah Ta'ala put love between uh, our husbands and our wives as there was love between Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyidatuna Aisha radiallahu anha. May oh Allah Ta'ala, we ask that you heal our marriages, Ya Allah. We ask that you heal our marriages. We ask that you make our marriages uh, meadows from the meadows of paradise, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We pray for our sick, Ya Allah. We pray for the father of our brother, Dukaf, uh, and the mother of our brother, Tahir Zafar. And we pray for our dear brother, Abu Muna Salah, Jason Ross Brown. O oh Allah, we ask that you heal him, Ya Allah. And we ask that you give his wife and his children sabr, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, Allahumma Rabbil Kareem. 
رب العرش العظيم اشفيه بشفائك يا رب العالمين الفاتحه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الرحمن الرحيم Amen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Khair. So, uh, we'll just take a few minutes. A uh, few minutes. Uh, I can't stay with you all to 11 o'clock as we usually do. Okay, so we'll just take about um, two uh, questions from the brothers and the sisters. Yes, inshallah. We'll take two brothers from the, two questions from the brothers and the sisters. And then we will close for the night. Jazakumullah khairan to all of you. Uh, and please, if you are not on our mailing list, if you get our newsletter, could you raise your hand if you get the newsletter? Sidi Yusuf, please take note. If you receive the newsletter in your email, raise your hand please. Okay. So we have a newsletter that tells you the events for the upcoming week. Please make sure uh, Ustad Yusuf gets your email address. So you know the next time we're going to go over this hadith, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, if you get the text, raise your hand. Text messages. Okay, if you want, oh, not even half. So if you want to get the text, if, you could, if someone could pass around a paper, one on the brother's side, one on the sister's side. If you would like to receive the regular email newsletter, please put your name on that paper. Uh, please, one of the brothers start one, one of the sisters start one. And if also, if you'd like to receive the text message, please put your phone number as well. Besides the text, text might get phased out. I'm sorry? Text, one, text might get phased out. And the okay. preference is email. Okay, the preference is email, Shal. Okay, now, Mr. I just wanted to make a comment. I think that a lot of people have a list of, uh, just to comment that, you know, one of, one of the problems in our society is that, um, there's a theory of maturity by a psychologist called by the name of Chris, Christopher Algeris okay. at Harvard. Yes. So he named he this so about seven scales mm. on which people are judged mature or immature. In our society, the test of maturity is always on the immature side. So you know, everything that he says is a sign of immaturity. He, he you know, in, in at least I come from Pakistan. It's a sign of maturity. So powerful. So one of them is don't show emotions. Yes. Because in Pakistan, showing emotions is a sign of maturity. Yes. And according to Chris Aguirre's theory of maturity, you, you show emo appropriate emotions according to you know, the situation. We are culturally bred in a way that is totally you know, yeah. opposite to what you're teaching. Yeah, subhanAllah. And what's, what's important for us as Muslims, I think, you know, the, the, the point uh, is really poignant that as Muslims, the Prophet Sallallahu is our model. And he showed emotions. You knew when he was happy. Right? You knew when the Prophet Sallallahu was happy. You knew when he was sad. You knew when he was angry. Right? Uh, and so a lot of times we have cultural legacies that we've inherited. And part of being Muslim is learning what is good in your culture that you must keep and what is in your culture that you need to transcend. You know, yeah. And uh, especially for, you know, you know showing, not, I mean, there's, there's a lot we can say about that. Uh, but there was, a, there was a lot of wisdom in why they, that was a virtue, you know, in the community. Uh, um, but we need to come to the, to the middle. Yeah, so. Okay, let's have a sister. Let's, I want to be fair. We believe in equal rights at the Muslim Center of Greater Princeton, right? Yeah. Gender equality. I want to find out yes, if this now. book is in English. Yes, it is. Same. But that's very big. This one is small. Okay. Yeah. So this is <laughs> it's it's the same book. Same exactly. But this is a translation, English and Arabic, and commentary. with commentary. So that's why it's so big. Yeah. So the PDF is available. Yeah. 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 But you can find it. Just type Shamail al Tirmidhi or Shamail al Muhammadiyah, and you can find the PDF. You can. There are many booksellers. This yes, this is it. Oh, is it? Yes, that's it. Okay. That's somebody it. gave for that. Person, okay. Somebody. Okay. Thank you. Yes, we're we're connect. Uh, we're collecting money, inshallah, for Sister Betty, whose husband just passed. 
uh, last Saturday. Okay, now, brother, now, Dr. Zach. I just had one question. Initially, you mentioned that the scholars, about these 11 women, said that this may not be the Khiba because they did not know each other's husbands. Yeah. Does that mean that if I talk about somebody that you do not know, it is not a Khiba? If I don't know yeah. the person, and it's not likely that I will discover the identity of the person, then it is not riba. Okay. Right? Then, then it is not riba, right? Um, but, but, the, so let, let me just walk that back just a little. little. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he defined riba as saying something about your brother they would not like you to say. Okay? Even if it's true. Even if it's true. Imam al-Nawawi, radiallahu anhu, he has a whole section on the uh, maharam al-lisan, right? the forbidden things to do with the tongue, and kitab al-adhkar. And there's a whole section on riba, and when riba is permissible, Sometimes riba is actually permissible, and other times it's obligatory. Sometimes, and there are exceptions. But generally, if I don't know who you're talking about, and you're speaking about them in a general sense, then it's not riba. For instance, the Prophet wasallam, he would say sometimes, what do you say about a people who does such and such, kada wa kada? And he would name a fault that someone does in the community. But he would s describe it in, a su in such a way, nobody in the masjid, nobody in Medina would know he who he was talking about. So it's permissible to do that if there is a benefit. If there is a benefit, whether it's a spiritual, religious benefit, or maybe someone's going into business with a brother or a sister, and you are warning them about going into business with that person business with that person or they want to get married to a prospect and you're warning them about getting married to this brother or getting married to that sister and then it's permissible even if you reveal their identity to make riba of that person no what i'm trying to say yeah. is that maybe these scholars were covering up these 11 women were actually doing riba because i've always thought that if I talk negative about somebody else, mm -hmm. whether the other person knows or not, I thought it was still evil. So are the scholars trying to, you know, say that these 11 women, because we are learning something out of it, that it is not actually evil? Did he know the other I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Um, so if I talk about Shaista to somebody else in Pakistan that does not know her, it's not evil. Is that? Talking about her for what benefit? Though? So, but but so if you are talking about Shaista, so so let's so if you're talking about Shaista, or let's not say Shaista. So if you're talking about someone to someone in a completely different country, and you're just describing what someone does, you say, you know, I know someone they do this and this and that. So it does not. Not Okay. It's not but I yeah. I don't know. You can understand it. You know, uh, sister, I just, I sister, this was still sister Shaista, you know, there's a sister in the masjid. She's always bringing tea. No, I'll, you know, I'll say good and uh, full of sugar. <laughs> like many of these. Any sisters? Any any sisters? Any? Yes. Sure. Okay. Hold on. Just park that. Just park that. I want to see if there's any questions related to the actual hadith. They have. Any, any sister with a question related to the topic? Any brothers with a question related to the topic? Okay, great. Well, this will be our last question. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to know from you that any case of uh, showing uh, sympathy to uh, a next door neighbor uh, someone have passed away. They're not on the religion of Islam. Who's not Muslim? They're not on the religion that they hold a book. Right, yeah, people. sure. So I want to know that it is what you can or cannot do. Well, in, in general, it's 
perfectly fine. And actually, it's encouraged to show sympathy with words like, our hearts are with you. You know, we are, uh, you know, our hearts in our prayers are with you in your time of loss and sadness. Right? Uh, it's permissible to uh, say, for instance, um, that uh, we, we pray that God gives them the best of what he gives those who die in their, in their state, right? Um, it's not permissible to do what a lot of people do in our society, where you say definitively, we know they're in a better place. Because we don't know. Right? And really, we don't know about, that, about anyone except someone who Allah Ta'ala informs us of in the Quran or we have an authentic hadith about. We hope, right? We hope that our family and our friends are in Jannah, right? We hope. But we shouldn't say things like, we know they're in a better place. Um, generally, the scholars, generally the, the ulama discourage praying for people uh, who pass away that it's not known definitively that they were Muslim. Uh, personally, I take the position uh, based on my studies that you can ask Allah to have mercy on them because the mercy of Allah Ta'ala encompasses all things. And uh, Sheikh Ali Juma or Guma, uh, who used to be uh, the Sheikh Al Azhar Mufti of Egypt, um, he also passed the fatwa a while ago. It's on his website that it's permissible to pray in a general sense for people who are not Muslim, not specific prayers, not specific prayers, oh Allah, you know, um, uh, for people who are not Muslim who are your family members. Uh, so I don't pray that oh, Allah put them in Jannah or anything like this, because if they're not Muslim, then Allah knows. But just you know, words of consolation, showing that you have empathy with them. Right? Visiting, bringing visiting f food, flowers is all good, right? And so this is the the legal position of most of the scholars, of most of the scholars. Yeah. Inshallah. Is that solved? Okay. No. no. But what's wrong is saying, Allah make God grant them Jannah because when I do my dua, yeah. I always say people who have passed away, nobody yeah. to pray for them. I mean, Muslims are non-Muslims, give them Jannah. I mean, Hamdi, you have a big heart. No, no. no, you, no, you, no you, you have a big heart. You said non-Muslims not to say that. Most of the most ulama discourage that. Because because it's not known that they died as Muslims, right? But you can you can extend that. I mean, you can take that uh, ma many places. Because only Allah knows what's in a person's heart when they die. Exactly. So, but but this is what most of them are saying. Uh, you're not bound to that, Sister Sh Shaista. You know, follow follow. It's okay. Inshallah. Do you have anything you want to say about that? Yeah. If your heart feels that. Bismillah. When we pass the cemetery of a non-Muslim cemetery, yeah. we say assalam. We say assalam. Yeah. We say assalam. Okay. You, you're asking me or you're telling me? Asking. No, I'm asking you. Uh -huh. is, it, is it permissible? So what I what I do, you know, I, I you know, I simply say assalamu alaikum ya ahlu kubur, min al mu'mini wa mu'minat. Right. I say, peace be upon you, O dwellers of the graves, from the believing men and women. Right? I don't know, even though it's a non-Muslim cemetery, there may be people in that graveyard who died on Iman. I don't know. Right? So I, I give salam directly to the believers from among them. And that's following the hadith of the Prophet yeah. Yeah, Of course. Yeah. This may sound a little, you know, a little harsh. I don't mean it to sound harsh, but there is the notion of if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is angry at something, we should not try to act like we're the merciful one in front of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I believe there's an ayah to that effect right in the Quran that it is not appropriate something of that to ask after someone has, you know, died not on Islam, mm -hmm. that to ask for forgiveness for that person. Is there such an ayah? Or? I know specifically about the munafiqun, the hypocrites. Yeah. So once, in, in other words, the, the idea that Ya Allah give Jannah to everybody, it's, 
not quite no. appropriate mm -hmm. in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're basically, you're, as if you're putting the judgment in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he should do. Okay, and the general, no? Allah can give jannah to whomever he wills. Whoever he pleases, exactly. Because and so your dua is an expression of your hope. Uh, growing up, all, all we heard was, God forbid, I know. you know how in Sri Lanka I people know. taste to cremate. Yeah, yeah. And that was an awful thing. And then yeah. we, we grew up in fear. So when I came here, somebody asked me, uh, what makes you think only the Muslims will go to heaven? Right, right. What about all the non-Muslims yeah. who are doing more for, uh, to, uh, for, the, for the orphans? and building up all these schools. Right. I mean, God will have something for them. So, again, we don't believe, this is really important, we don't believe only Muslims are going to Jannah. Yes, okay. Even Rasulullah mm -hmm. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us that. Okay. But he did say 80% of Jannah right, is going to be from the Muslims. Uh -huh. right? Well, does this mean Muslims from all of history or Muslims just from his Ummah? Allahu A'lam. Allah knows best. But we don't believe only Muslims are going to Jannah. There will be people of many different re religions. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters people of Iman into Jannah. And we also believe that those people who did not receive the clear invitation uh, to Tawheed, to the oneness of God, to follow the prophets and to believe in the resurrection after death, we believe that those people will also go to Jannah. Right? Maybe they, they didn't practice any religion, or maybe they were Christian or Buddhists, but they were never reached by the clear message of Islam given with wisdom, right? And given with beautiful words. Right? These are the three things that the message of Islam should be delivered with, with wisdom, with beautiful words, and with compelling arguments, right? logical arguments. Imam al-Ghazali and many of our great scholars say these people have an amnesty from Allah and Allah Ta'ala will not punish them. So what my scholars, uh, what my teachers always told us was not to say definitively Absolute and absolutely, this person is going to Jannah or this person is going to hellfire. And there's some, a lot of Muslims who think that way. But to be hopeful, and uh, you know, this is not the time or the place, but we could go into a whole um, exposition about the different opinions about Jannah and the eternality of the hellfire and what different scholars have said about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just say this, all the ulama are absolutely in agreement that Jannah is eternal and everlasting. Right? But as far as Jahannam, there's difference of opinions. right? And there's differences of opinion about who goes to the hellfire and how, or how long they'll stay and all of these things. But these are really deep theological issues um, that it really, you know, I would much rather you spend your time taking care of the orphans and feeding the poor and all of these things than going into these theological minutia. Uh, the last thing I want to say on this is that doing good in the world is one thing. And having faith and iman in your creator is another thing. Usually they go hand in hand. But sometimes they don't. And sometimes you will have people who do great good. They're very charitable. Uh, you know, they wouldn't harm a fly, but they deny their creator. Right? What many of our scholars say is that you ask, doesn't Allah have something for them? What many scholars say is that Allah will reward those people in this life. But because they had no belief in the afterlife, because they had no belief in Allah, then they will have no reward in the afterlife. And they will have no reward with Allah based on their own choice. Based on their choice. Of course, this is a person who 
has received the message with wisdom, with beauty, and with compelling logic. I'm not talking about someone who's ignorant or someone who all they've heard about Islam is, you know, uh, Daniel Pipes and Sean Hannity and Stephen Emerson. I'm not talking about those people, all right? Because those people have an excuse, right? They didn't meet Sister Shaista, right? They didn't meet Ustad Yusuf. All they, had, all they knew about Islam was what the pundits and the talking heads say about, you know, who are, who are on, on, on uh, Fox News or wherever, right? They have an excuse. Those people who are presented the clear message of Islam, but still reject it. Even if they do good, many of our scholars say they will not have any portion of Jannah based on their own denial. That is a reward, that is a, a recompense for their own denial of Allah. But their good deeds are rewarded. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not... Allah is ash-shakur, you know, so He will reward their good deeds. Uh, One of my yeah. teachers, uh, he said that the likeness of such a person is like if somebody comes to your house and cleans up your yard, rakes your yard, cleans up the flower bed, everything, makes your house look nice, but then comes inside and insults your mother. Oh my God. So that was the likeness that he gave, that that's what it's like to do all this good in this world, but not to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So <laughs> until Allah belongs the highest similar to me. Is that we clear on that? So this is a deep issue. Another, inshallah, another time we have more time we can go into it, right? But we, you know, there's some, and it, it, it's a consequence of living here. You know, a lot of people, especially our Christian brothers and sisters, who many times, you know, they, they're not very knowledgeable of their own religion. They believe, so there's one extreme who, they only believe Christians are going to paradise, heaven, right? Or 144,000 saints. Right? Or, or going to heaven, or you have to be saved like the evangelical Christians. But then there are others who believe everyone's going to heaven. Right? The Muslim, we, that's not what the Quran teaches. And as a Muslim, we have to read the Quran, we have to study the Quran. The Quran does not teach, when you, if you read the Quran, it does not teach everyone is going to heaven. It doesn't teach that. Yeah. So the. Sorry? Sorry, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's not going to heaven. We hope, we hope that the people we love and the people we care about, whatever their religion, that Allah gives them Jannah. We hope for that. Yeah. You know, we hope for that. Um, but we, that's not what the Quran teaches. And so ultimately our faith, our belief, should be based on the Quran. You know, at the very minimum. And, and also on the authentic uh, mutawatir, the multiply narrated uh, with multiple chains, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ with multiple chains of narration. Yeah, it's about 300 of them. This is the very minimum. The Qur'an and those maybe 300 hadith that are called mutawatir. They're related by so many different co companions. Impossible that they were forged. That's the very minimum that every Muslim should believe in, act upon, and adhere to. And we'll be going over those, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah. So we'll stop here. Have a blessed night. And uh, forgive us if there's anything we said that was a mistake. If, if there's any benefit in what we said, all praise belongs to Allah. Only the mistakes are mine. Jazakallah khair. My two patients are coming tomorrow. The two, I texted you. Okay. One thirty oh, and the new masjid. Oh, oh, just, just one thing. Just one, one. So I'll go one, just one other announcement, I'm so sorry. Tomorrow, uh, Imam Shane Atkinson is going to be speaking at uh, 145 about religion, redemption, and reaching our youth. He's come all the way from North Carolina. He's a convert to Islam, who's an imam and a chaplain. Uh, and he's a really powerful speaker and a poet as well. And uh, Dr. Manzoor Hussein, uh, who's with us, and his wife, Sister Jenna, is with us. Uh, they'll, uh, he'll be having a meeting tomorrow for um, the Interfaith Committee here at the Masjid. If you're interested in joining that committee, Sister Shaista, right, yes, we need you at 4 p.m., inshallah. Youth as well as uh, elders, 4 p.m., inshallah. Okay. Yes. So if you're busy, I'll bring them here. Okay. What time? Two people who are in Islam. What time? What time are they coming? One thirty. Ooh, right after the hall. I texted you to.